Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, once again to a virtual Daggers. Thank you for coming. I'm Anthony Johnston, thriller writer, joint vice chair of the CWA, and the man pulling all of tonight's technical levers. We ran this event in a similar fashion last year, as a live event wasn't possible. And of course, sadly, the same is unfortunately uh, still true here in 2021. Hopefully tonight will go as smoothly as last year, but we do have people, including shortlisted authors, attending from all over the world. So please bear with us if we experience any technical hitches. With that, I am gonna retreat from the stage and hand you over to our master of ceremonies for the evening, the inexhaustible Barry Forshaw. Barry, please take it away. Thank you, Anthony. And I hope you can all hear me. I see that some people are having some difficulty connecting. There may be the odd technical glitch tonight, and I apologize in advance for that. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to the 2021 CWA Daggers, sponsored by ALCS, Ian Fleming Publications, Pro Writing Aid, and Superior Books. I'm your host for the evening, Barry Forshaw, and I've well, I've probably written more books and newspaper reviews on the subject of crime fiction than the world really needs. Starting with a review, I think, of P.D. James for a newspaper in the north of England, which I submitted as, believe it or not, handwritten copy, and they still published it. Now, crime fiction was popular then, but nothing like as all-conquering as it is today. And the proof that the genre is in the rudest of health is the very ceremony you're watching and hopefully hearing tonight. As I say every year, the Crime Writers Association Daggers are the Oscars of the crime fiction world. The most prestigious prizes, the absolute pinnacle. And I'll say to first-time winners this evening, you couldn't get a better start. Now, despite my not wearing a dinner jacket, tonight we're going to try to do our best to recreate the excitement of a live Daggers event, even though we still can't be together as we normally would. But we do have many of the shortlisted authors live uh, in the audience, and hopefully they'll be able to hear from the winners as they receive their awards. We can't hand them their trophies, of course, but they will, I am assured, be posted out tomorrow. So if you're on a shortlist, perhaps make sure, as we said last year, that you really should be dressed at least from the waist up, the bit we can see. We really don't care what you're wearing below the waist. I decided against my tux, but Abby Mukherjee has told me he will be wearing his sparring. Also, you should make sure that you're not sitting in too dark a room. I've got about five lights on around me. Remember, we need to see how well preserved you are or otherwise. And we're not judgmental, honestly. If you've paid to have work done, we want to see it. And if you're young and fresh faced, you've got nothing to worry about, have you? So once again, before we start, I apologize for the fact that it will be mainly my face you'll be seeing all evening. We couldn't have me bringing on all the judges and winners in person as we usually do. The judges are really, I'm sorry that they aren't here, but I will introduce them all. This is already a very challenging business. And handling the technical side of things and metaphorically holding my hand, as he just said, is one of Britain's top thriller writers, Anthony Johnston, who, like me, has also worked in the comics field. If there are any electronic glitches, they will not be down to him, but to the vagaries of the internet. Just be grateful I'm not handling the technical side of things as I'm about as good with computers as I am with haute cuisine. And I can promise you an evening that will be as technically impressive as the launch of GB News. So before we get to the awards, we're going to briefly hear from the chair of the Crime Writers Association, Maxim Jakubowski, and from our guest speaker. So let's begin with someone I've known for many years, a man who, like Cleopatra, age, cannot wither nor custom stale. He is an eminent author, editor, ex-bookstore owner, and one of Britain's premier crime anthologists, among many other disciplines, too bloody numerous to mention. Joining us live, hopefully, the CWA chair, Mr. Maxim Jakubowski. Welcome to the Dago Awards 2021. The Crime Writers Association was founded in 1953 and the Daggers began two years later in 1955, which means that this is actually the 65th anniversary of the CWA Daggers, which I think makes them not only prestigious, as Barry pointed out, but also uh, probably one of the oldest long-standing uh, literary awards in the UK, if not in the world. 
I'm happy to say that uh, even though uh, the publishing industry and the literary world has been badly affected by the pandemic, that the CWA has managed to conquer all the obstacles over the last few years. Our membership is expanding, uh, our initiatives are growing, and we're more active than ever in uh, encouraging, supporting, uh, and promoting the art of crime writing, whether it be fiction or non-fiction. Basically tonight, we have a wonderful array of shortlisted books. Uh, I'm one of the few people in the know, so I know you're going, you have a lot of wonderful surprises ahead of you. So all I can say is that I hope that uh, next year we can all be together in the same room and celebrate crime together, not just on screen, but in a wonderful new environment that will look very much like our past. So good luck to all the shortlisted people. Congratulations in, congratulations in advance to all the winners and over to you, Barry. Thank you, thank you, Max. And um, as both Anthony and I have said, there may be technical glitches tonight, so we've started as we may well go on. And I'm sure that all the people listening tonight will be patient with us and the internet. We all know that the internet will always screw you in the end. So let's hear from our guest speaker, who hopefully we will be able to hear. This is a novelist who's more Scottish than Ian Rankin, Val McDermott and Denise Minor combined, of whom I wrote. The response to the Raj set novels of Abhya Mukherjee has been one of unalloyed praise, not least for the fact that these exuberant narratives are so nuanced in the treatment of an era. So let's welcome the creator of English copper Sam Wyndham and the intuitive Sergeant Surendranath Banerjee, Abhya Mukherjee. Hello everybody. Hi, I'm Abhya Mukherjee. Um, you may remember me as the writer of such classics as A Rising Man and um, other rather less successful titles. Um, I should start by saying thank you to the Crime Writers Association for inviting me to give the address tonight. Um, I understand that after his triumph last year, the board did actually ask Richard Osman to come back and give the speech again tonight, but he was busy. So they went for the next best thing, someone <laughs> resembling a pint-sized Richard Osman with the beard and the glasses, but sadly, without the talent. Um, luckily, Barry Forshaw felt that what I lacked in talent, I more than compensated for in diversity points. Uh, and once the D word was mentioned, nobody was willing to argue with him. Um, when the CWA approached me about speaking to Tonight, they said, how would you like to spend an evening in the company of Barry Forshaw? And of course, I reacted the way anyone would. I smiled and tried to change the subject. But then I remembered that I've got a new book coming out soon. And as long as Barry's still reviewing for the newspapers, you are, aren't you, Barry? You're still reviewing. I am, yes. Yeah, I thought it was probably worth staying in the good books of that wonderful, fantastic gentleman. So I said, maybe. Uh, and then they said I could do it in my slippers. And I said, I'd be delighted. So here we are again, gathering, again virtually, alas, to celebrate the, be the best and the brightest in the world of crime and mystery fiction. Um, and what a year it's been. Despite lockdown, the sales of crime fiction have continued to head inexorably upwards, like the latest projections of the Delta variant or the misplaced hopes of the English football fans. Um, meanwhile, average author incomes continue to fall, affording men any of us the opportunity for invaluable research at food banks and job centres. After last year, we all expected that we'd be meeting together in person this year, and it's a, it's a tragedy that we aren't. For one thing, if we're honest, many of us crime writers only got into the game for the free food and drink at events like the Daggers. I know I did. Um, you know, bestsellers and million dollar advances are all very good as dreams go, but it's the glasses of Romanian Chablis and the rubber chicken Kievs that sustain us while we're waiting for the world to realize our true genius. Um, but it's not just the material sustenance of these occasions that I'm missing. There's also the spiritual sustenance the sole food of being around other authors and going through our shared rituals. Um, the nature of what we do is solitary. At least that's what I tell my kids, but they won't leave me alone. 
idiots. Um, and nights like tonight are, are red letter days in the featureless wasteland that comprises most of our social calendar. And so to be missing out once again on gathering together feels like a punch in the face from Jack Reacher or a kick in the balls from Miss Marple. <laughs> so here's what I wish had happened this year. I wish we were all meeting somewhere Knowing the CWA, it would probably be somewhere elegant, yet supremely cost-effective business hotel, somewhere on the fringes of London's glamorous zone too. I wish that five hours ago I'd been forced into a panic trying to find that black tie and tuxedo um, for that one event in the year that I needed to wear it. After 10 minutes of frantic rummaging, I'd finally find it on the floor of the wardrobe, lying there like some tragic victim from a golden age mystery, killed trying to escape from Narnia. I try it on only to find a kebab wrapper in the pocket and the crystallized remains of curry sauce on one of the lapels. A memento from the sad journey home after the daggers two years ago. Um, that was a night of ignominy where the only th thing I took home was indigestion. Eventually I'd give up on the tux and it would probably be for the best anyway, because whenever I wear black tie, either Mick Heron or Belinda Bauer will inevitably mistake me for a waiter. Um, instead, I'd reach for another suit, only to find that the waistband on the trousers have inexplicably shrunk, or at least that's what I'll tell myself. The truth is, I suffer from that debilitating condition which afflicts, afflicts so many of us in this industry, and which goes by the name of crime writer's arse. In the end, there'd be nothing for it but to reach for that most wonderful of garments, my trusty arse-forgiving kilt. I put it on, sauntered down Guildford High Street to the station like a brown Bonnie Prince Charlie come to claim his rightful throne. I jump on the first train to London, remembering to properly socially distance while travelling. I'd rock up at the venue two minutes after the doors open and a good hour and a half before proceedings kick off, knowing that getting there that early means I've got a small chance of getting to the bar before M.W. Craven finishes all the wine. <laughs> I'd wander in, cast a glance around, just to see who's about. There'd be the crime fiction royalty, of course, Denise Miner chatting to Mark Billingham, and maybe they'd catch me staring at them. Play it cool, Mukherjee, I'd tell myself. Play it cool. Don't come across as that fawning fanboy you really are. Remember, you've scared them with that in the past, and that restraining order that Billingham took out is technically still in place. <laughs> and remember to keep breathing. That's it, right? In, out, in, out. There you go. Hang on. Are they waving? Oh my God, Denise Minot and Mark Billingham are waving at me. A-listers are waving at me. I'd, I'd give them a little wave back and then I'd realise they weren't waving at me at all, but at Richard Osman, who's standing right behind me. And then, oh my God, I'd start to hyperventilate again. Ignoring Mr. Osman, I would glance around looking for my tribe. You know, those, th those feisty mid-listers like me, a combination of the wizened old 40 and 50-somethings, and beside them, the cool, up-and-coming, hot young things who are all hanging off every golden word that drips from the soft, ruby-red lips of the sultry Will Dean. <laughs> Meanwhile, us shriveled-up 40 and 50-somethings look on, both secretly envying at the same and at the same time feeling sorry for these newbies because we too were all hot young things once and look how that turned out and then I'd realized that Richard Osman's shadow is falling on me and as a good Hindu boy I would utter a quick prayer to one of the gods Lord Krishna or Lord Ganesh maybe luckily I'm spoiled for choice because we have millions of gods to choose from and I'd ask them to make it so that some of the talent contained in Richard Osman's shadow might fall on me um, now, trying to extract a blessing from the talent contained in Richard Osman's shadow might sound naive to you, um, but my mum swears it's a thing, and that's enough for me. And besides, at this stage of my career, I'm open to trying anything. Anyway, I'd then probably find a group of sympathetic souls and drink myself happy, a bit of Dutch courage until it was time to make this speech. I'd get up, swagger to the stage, resplendent in my kilt, for the Mac Mukherjee tartan is, after all, a thing of beauty. I would congratulate all the shortlisted nominees and tell them what an honour it is to just be shortlisted for some of the most prized accolades in the world of crime fiction. I'd ask them to look around, see the great and the good assembled in the room and realise just what an achievement it is to be shortlisted for a dagger. I would tell them that if the fates conspired against them tonight and that they didn't win, that it would hurt. And it should hurt because the daggers are important. But I'd tell them that making the shortlist once shows that they've the talent to do it again and again if need be. And that this should be the impetus to write more and to write better. 
And to those that went on to win, I would say congratulations. This is something that no one can take away from you. And just look at the roll call of authors who've come before you. You've achieved something wonderful tonight. And there are so many wonderful writers shortlisted across categories tonight and so many wonderful books. It's a celebration of the depth of talent and the breadth of stories that our little corner of crime fiction has to offer. And while I'd wish good luck to all of those shortlisted, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my dear friend and podcast partner in crime, Vaseem Khan. I've got my fingers crossed for you, buddy. I keep my speech short, but I would make sure to mention the topic of diversity and inclusivity just to make the straight white people in the room feel uncomfortable because that gives me a kick. Um, but seriously, folks, it's 2021. And while the CWA and others are making strides, we can and we should do more to make sure that stories from all parts of our rich society are showcased and celebrated. So that would be my wish list for tonight. It's a shame I just won't get a chance to do it all. Um, most of all, though, I wish the CWA were paying me to talk to you. I asked them, but they said no, because they blew the whole budget on Barry Forshaw. Um, and with that, let me end by paying a wee tribute to the man himself. Barry Forster is our rock, our pole star, our one constant in these tempestuous times. Benjamin Franklin may have thought that death and taxes were the only certainties in life, but to those, I think we can now add Barry Forshaw presenting the daggers, and long may he continue. Thank you. Good luck to all those shortlisted, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Abby. Uh, I've now got the unenviable task of following Abby Mukherjee, but I have to. So without further ado, let's get on with the business of the evening, the Crime Writers Oscars, the CWA Daggers. So on behalf of the CWA, I'd like to thank all the independent judges and panel chairs for the effort and damned hard work they put into the Daggers throughout the year. They have a mountain of books to tackle, the good, the bad, and plenty in between. But the best books remind us why we love the genre, and the judges guide us to the best. So we begin with the debut dagger. This is a competition for writers who have not yet been published traditionally, and they don't have an agent. They submit the opening of a crime novel up to 3,000 words, plus a synopsis. The debut dagger is widely recognized as a talent finder and has helped launch the crime writing careers of authors such as M.W. Craven, Amir Anwar, Ros Watkins, and many more. Now, Lee Russell, you've heard of the woman in black and you've heard of the woman in white. The chair of the judging panel, not here tonight, but she is the woman in purple. You really have to see her to understand that. The creator of Geraldine Steele, Lee Russell. And this dagger is sponsored by Pro Writing Aid. So, Let's hear from them now. Hi everyone, it's Lisa here from Pro Writing Aid. Thank you for letting me pop on just to say a quick hello. It's been such a thrill for us this year to sponsor the debut dagger and see all of these new authors coming up in the world of crime writing. Um, we just wanted to thank you, say thank you so much to everyone for welcoming us so generously into the Crime Writers Association community. And a huge thank you to everyone who's come and joined the Pro Writing Aid community as well. We've seen this huge influx of crime writers, and you can really see it in our Facebook groups and other communities, how they're working together and supporting each other and um, holding each other accountable and making sure they get their word counts done. So thank you for all of that. Our, our mission as a company is to empower people to share their stories and share their ideas by inspiring and educating and helping them to become the author and the writer that they always wanted to be. And so... We hope that our sponsorship this year helps more writers get their work out in front of the right people so that it, they can find their readers. And, and if that happens, then we've reached our goal as a company and we've reached our goal with this sponsorship. So everyone who entered this year should feel incredibly proud of themselves because we all know how difficult it is to get a manuscript finished, edited, and then to have the courage to send it out into the world. So everyone that made the, the long list and the short list should feel incredibly proud of themselves. And very best of luck this year to Ashley and Fiona and Biba and Hannah and Jennifer and Edward because it was a really exceptional list of writers. So without further ado, I think we should go and find out who this year's winner is. Back over to you, Barry. Thank you, Lisa. So the shortlisted entries are the Looking Glass Spy by Ashley Harrison, Underwater by Fiona McPhillips, 
Rough Justice by Bieber Pierce, Deception by Hannah Redding, Lightfoot by Edward Reckoney, Mandatory Reporting by Jennifer Wilson O'Reilly. So, the judge is highly commended Underwater by Fiona McPhillips. The judges said, the narrative of Underwater has a reflective quality and is well-written and perceptive. A haunting story with engaging characterization. And the winner is, let me reach for the first envelope and hope I don't have a Warren Beatty fade on away moment. The winner is Deception by Hannah Redding. The judges said, this is a gripping plot written in alternate viewpoints in strong and assured prose. The situation is cleverly set up with two women isolated together with a killer on the loose and only a police officer for protection. Thank you. Um, thank you to the CWA and the judges. Um, writing can be uh, such a solitary and sometimes thankless pursuit. So it is a, it's a real honor to have my scribbled daydreams hold the attention of such esteemed company. Um, I'd like to congratulate all my fellow longlisters and shortlisters and very quickly uh, thank two sets of people. My, my lovely writing friends, Emily, Sam, Annie, Louise Walters and Nicola Upson, uh, but above all my family, my ever patient family who for far too long now have had to put up with me going on about imaginary arguments between people I've made up in my head. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, and congratulations again. I'm going to reach for my glass of wine and you're my first toast of the evening. So we come to the Dagger in the Library. <laughs> an award given for a body of work by an established crime writer who has long been popular with borrowers from UK libraries. It also rewards authors who've supported libraries and their users and is nominated by librarians throughout the UK. Now, when I ask writers if there was someone in their life who guided them to the right books, the answer is usually yes. Similarly, when I ask if there was a library which was a home away from home in their youth, the answer is also usually yes. Mine was Oral Park Library in Liverpool. So let's all pay a socially distanced tribute and raise a glass to librarians in the UK. I hope you've all got glasses. Librarians. I'm sure that most of you watching this owe a debt to libraries and librarians who deserve every ounce of our support, don't they? Now, the chair of the judging panel, who you won't see, is a woman who's worked in public libraries for more than 40 years. She won't mind me telling you that. And before that, she was a prison librarian for many years. Having spent a lot of time with the real thing, she finds crime fiction much more entertaining. Sue Wilkinson. And the shortlisted authors are Lisa Jewell, Peter May, Denise Minor, James Oswald, L.J. Ross, and C.L. Taylor. And the winner is, time for the second envelope, Peter May. The judges said Peter May infuses his books with a real sense of place, whether it be China, France, or the Hebrides. His books are tense, atmospheric, and complex, but always utterly absorbing. So I'm going to reach for my glass and say congratulations, Peter. Hello. Thank you. Wow. Fantastic. I my, my wife provided a, a glass of bubbly just in case, so I shall, I shall join you in Cheers. that, Barry. <laughs> Cheers. Fantastic. You know, as you say, libraries are, I mean, they're the most important thing. They're what fed my insatiable desire for reading when I was a kid. We went every Friday night as a family to the local library and come back loaded with books, which we read during the week and went again the next week in my Teen years and in my uh, 20s, libraries, was, that's where I went. I didn't have the money to buy books in those days. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, without them, you know, where would we all be? Um, it's a sad fact that uh, government seems to be pulling resources from libraries all over the place. And I think we need to do whatever we can to uh, prevent that from happening or uh, reverse the tide, if you like. But it's um, uh, a great honour 
to uh, receive this award, um, particularly among such distinguished company. Um, and I owe a, 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 a special debt of gratitude to my publisher, Quercus, and my editor, John Riley, who uh, believed in me when almost nobody else did. Um, so uh, to everybody, once again, many thanks. Cheers, Peter, and Cheers. thank you very much. And hopefully see you next year, if not this year. So we come to the dagger for the best crime and mystery publisher. This is a relatively recent award, but it's proved to be very popular because we really need those publishers, don't we? When I've complimented publishers on their crime lists bulging with talent, I sometimes have the reply, Joe and Jane Public don't know who publish particular writers and they couldn't care less. It's only people like you, meaning me, who keep an eye on who's in our lists. But I imagine most of the clued up audience who are watching this are fully aware of the crucial value of publishers, particularly in the crime genre. And now it's time for the dagger for the best crime and mystery publisher. For this award, UK publishers and imprints are nominated by a wide ranging group of reviewers, booksellers, festival organizers, bloggers, literary agents, and journalists. The winner is then selected from a shortlist by the CWA board. Now, the shortlisted publishers are Faber and Faber, Head of Zeus, Michael Joseph, No Exit Press, Raven, and Viper. And I'll reach for the next envelope. And the winner is Head of Zeus. Unfortunately, they can't be here to accept this award. They were founded in uh, 2012 as an independent publisher with a strong and wide ranging catalog, not just in crime, but they made a decisive showing in our favorite genre, having great success with books by authors such as Ken Bruin, Leslie Thompson, CJ Box and Martin Edwards. The judges called Head of Zeus a growing and well-balanced list which goes from strength to strength, combining talents from all over the writing world and across subgenres, and willing to take risks with mid-list authors as well as new names. So congratulations to Head of Zeus. We move on now to the awards which honor the best books, stories, fiction, and nonfiction. Starting with the short story dagger. This is awarded to a crime short story which is first published or broadcast in the UK in English between one and 15,000 words. Now the chair of the judging panel has been a publicist for 10 years. And I have to say, she's a publicist who prods newspaper reviewers like me rather than nag us, which is just how we like it, really. Currently with FMCM Associates, Sophie Goodfellow. And the shortlisted stories are Deathbed by L. Croft in Afraid of the Light, edited by Robert Scragg and published by Criminal Minds Group. Planting Nan by James Delargy, also in Afraid of the Light. Monsters by Claire McIntosh, in the first edition, celebrating 21 years of Goldsboro Books. Cheers for that. Published by the Dome Press. Daddy Dearest by Dominic Nolan in Afraid of the Light. A Dog is for Life, Not Just for Christmas by Robert Scragg in Afraid of the Christmas Lights, edited by Miranda Joess and published by Criminal Minds Group. And Hunted by Victoria Selman, also in Afraid of the Christmas Lights. And the winner is Monsters by Claire McIntosh, featured in the anthology first edition, celebrating 21 years of Goldsboro books, published by the Dome Press. And the judges said of Claire's book uh, story, a, a powerful twist turns this vivid, brilliantly written and carefully plotted story about a child's fear of the forbidden cellar into something much scarier. So there's Claire. Congratulations, Claire, and cheers. Cheers. I, I feel I haven't got wine. I've got water. Um, but cheers. That'll do. That's OK. <laughs> everyone. Um, were we supposed to write speeches? This is. Um... You can just say a few words, Claire. OK, well, thank you. This is amazing. I find short stories incredibly hard to write. And the only reason 
I wrote Monsters was because I loved the anthology and I, you know, loved Goldsboro as I think we all do. Um, and so because of that, it became a really special story and it's really lovely, really lovely to see it recognised like this. Um, I loved the anthology and loved reading everyone else's. So uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Claire. Now we come to one which is a particular favourite of mine, the crime fiction and translation dagger. A writer who shall remain nameless once said to me that people like myself who write about crime fiction had a duty to promote the books of their own nation, which I do. But that hasn't stopped me writing several books on crime written in languages other than English. And I think that that kind of parochialism, dare we say, it was a minority view. Most crime writers I know are well aware of that some of the exemplary writing is coming from the non-Anglophone world. And that's what this particular award celebrates. The award is given for a crime or thriller novel, which has been translated into English and published in the UK. The chair of the judging panel is our very own Maxim Jakubowski, and the shortlisted books are Anxious People by Frederick Backman, translated by Neil Smith, published by Michael Joseph. The Coral Bride by Roxanne Bouchard, translated by David Warriner, published by Arenda Books. The Disaster Tourist by Yoon Koan, translated by Lizzie Buehler, published by Serpent's Tale. Three by D.A. Mishani, translated by Jessica Cohen and published by River Rum. To Cook a Bear by Mikael Nimi, translated by Deborah Bragan Turner and published by MacLeo's Press. And The Seven Doors by Agnes Ravitan, translated by Rosie Hedger and published by Arenda Books. And the winner is, next envelope, The Disaster Taurus by Yoon Koan, translated by Lizzie Buller and published by Serpent's Tale. Congratulations to both the uh, author and the translator. The judges call this a wildly entertaining eco-thriller from South Korea that lays bare with mordant humor, the perils of overdeveloped capitalism. So congratulations, Koan, and congratulations, Lizzie. Thank you. <laughs> uh, right now, it's four o'clock in the morning in Korea. Uh, thanks to the time difference, I am enjoying a very secret midnight awards ceremony. Uh, 제 이름을 부르셨을 때 음, 너무 놀라서 지금 느낌이 꼭 다른 차원으로 가는 웜홀을 발견한 느낌이에요. 이 환상적인 웜홀로 기꺼이 들어가서 앞으로 더 자유롭게 글을 쓰겠습니다. 아, 고마운 분들이 너무 많은데 음, CWA에게도 고맙고요. 그리고 이 소설을 발견하고 매혹적으로 번역해준 어, 리지 빌러 그리고 바바라 지토 프로파일 북스 그리고 제 독자분들과 이 즐거움을 함께 하고 싶습니다. 감사합니다. I think we can all agree with everything that Yung Koan said there, can we not? The only, the only <웃음> I, was, was Lizzie. So congratulations, Lizzie. So I can, uh, thank you so much. I, I can interpret um, what Cohen's just uh, speech and comments um, said. So um, thank you very much. It was such a surprise to hear my name and it almost felt like I was entering a wormhole into another dimension uh, when I heard my name called and I'm looking forward to continuing to, to write even more and to bringing new readers um, to my books and thank you very much to the CWA, to my agent Barbara Zitwer and to um, the everyone at, at Serpent's Tale as well as to Lizzie Bueller who discovered and translated this book into English. Um, and I'll just add that I agree with everything that you. Cohen said. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that Lizzie and I, I think it's it's important that we recognize translators. The CWA is well aware of the importance of translators with which we could not read books like like the one we're talking about right now. Thank you both. So let's move on to the um, nonfiction for a moment. It's time to award the ALCS Gold Dagger for nonfiction. This is for work on a crime related theme, first published in the UK in English. It encompasses true crime, biography, 
historical crime, critical studies, and more. Now, do you remember those recent news stories in which various public bodies said, grammar doesn't matter anymore? There is one man who is prepared to commit bloody murder when he hears such things. The chair of the judging panel is that distinguished man of letters, Philip Gooden. And this dagger is sponsored by ALCS. So let's hear from them now. Hello, my name is Barbara Hayes and I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of the Authors Licensing and Collecting Society. We represent the rights of authors across the spectrum, which has allowed us to collect over half a billion pounds for authors since we were formed back in 1977 and to enable us to pay these monies to our 112,000 writer members. We are delighted to be sponsors of the ALCS Gold Dagger for Nonfiction. Our association with the Crime Writers Association dates back many years, and we are proud that lots of your writer members are also members of ALCS, and that we can pay them the monies due to them for the secondary uses of their works. This last year has been a particularly astonishing one for the amount of literature and TV and radio works by our members that have been used and enjoyed by so many people during the lockdown. These works really have provided a lifeline and distraction to the terrible times we have found ourselves in, but hopefully not for too much longer. So as our world is starting to look more optimistic towards the future and back to some semblance of normality, I'd like to close by wishing all the shortlisted authors the best of luck and enjoy the awards. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Now, the shortlisted books are Written in Bone by Sue Black, published by Doubleday, We Keep the Dead Close by Becky Cooper, published by William Heinemann, These Are Not Gentle People by Andrew Harding, published by MacLeos Press, Dancing with the Octopus by Deborah Harding, published by Profile Books Limited, The Book of Trespass by Nick Hayes, published by Bloomsbury Circus, Agent Sonia by Ben McIntyre, published by Viking. And the winner is Written in Bone by Sue Black, published by Doubleday. The judges said, anatomist and forensic pathologist professor Dame Sue Black's retelling of significant cases, though often grisly, is always informed with sympathy and the desire to understand exactly what happened. When this combines with reflections on some very varied experiences, together with a touch of autobiography, it makes for a humane and wise book. So congratulations, Sue. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if you can see and hear me, but I'm hoping so. We can. Um, I have to say I'm utterly shocked, but, but what a wonderful shock to have. So, so thank you to you, Barry. Thank you to ALCS. And thank you as well to CWA. Of course, in, in fact, these... For in, in books of fact, these sound like stories. And whilst they are stories, they're stories that relate to real incidents. These are people who have been impacted by crime. And I know that crime writing is a huge entertainment, but it is also a really sobering aspect of the work that we do. So to have it recognized, for me, it, it's a recognition of those who find themselves in these unfortunate situations that require the kind of expertise that we have. And it's for them that I'm just delighted to accept this reward. So my thanks to Susanna Waitson and to Patsy Irwin from Double David, also to Michael Alcock, who's my agent. And thank you very much indeed to all of you. A huge surprise, but a lovely way to end an evening for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, and congratulations. And I know that apart from your own talents, you are and have proved to be an invaluable resource for other crime writers. So moving back to fiction, we come to the Superior Books Historical Dagger. I used to be a judge for this, and I used to sit by the river uh, judging the merits of some wonderful historical crime novels, and that the genre is still doing really well. But there is an army of historical sleuths operating in the mean streets of ancient Rome through the Tudor period to the Cold War era of the 1950s. Historical crime is burgeoning in popularity. And this award is given to the best historical crime novel, first published in the UK in English, set in a period up to 50 years prior to the present day. For novels with mixed timelines, at least three quarters of the book must be set in an earlier period. 
Uh, the chair of the judging panel is Professor Edward James. Edward is Emeritus Professor of Medieval History at University College Dublin. He's published numerous papers on the archaeology, art, and history of early medieval Europe. And this dagger is sponsored by Superior Books. So let's hear from them. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Durant, and I'm the editorial director of Superior Books. Superior Books is the proud sponsor of the Historical Dagger Award. Here at Superior, we are real champions of historical writing, particularly crime fiction. And so we jumped at the chance to sponsor this prestigious award. We would like to thank the CWA so much for all their support since we launched in 2018, and in particular for introducing us to such wonderful authors. So thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the shortlist. And the shortlisted books are Snow by John Banville, published by Faber, Midnight at Malabar House by Vasim Khan, published by Hodder and Stoughton, The Unwanted Dead by Chris Lloyd, published by Orion Fiction, The City Under Siege by Michael Russell, published by Constable, Skelton's Guide to Domestic Poisons by David Stafford, published by Allison and Busby, The Mimosa Tree Mystery by Ovidia Yu, published by Constable. And the winner is... <sighs> It's a man I've learned just to say yes to whatever he suggests. Midnight at Malabar House by Vasim Khan, published by Hudder and Stoughton. The judges call this book a delight to read. And we're impressed by the way in which Khan, without assuming any knowledge of independence and partition on the part of the reader, depicted the complex world of Bombay in 1950. But above all, they admired the skillful and nuanced characterization of Persis Wadia herself. So... Vass, congratulations. Well, thanks, Barry. Um, you know me, I've, I've known you for a few years. I'm, I'm really gobsmacked, but I am quite dumbstruck at the moment. Um, before I get to my thank yous, I, I want to take a few seconds to talk about a topic that's uh, swirling around the industry. And I think it's worth acknowledging on an evening like this. Uh, so before anyone groans, I want to talk about inclusivity, but don't panic. There's no need to put on your tin hats. I'll only take a few seconds or to put it another way, you have no choice but to bear with me because you really don't want to drag a brown man off stage in this, in this particular year. I spent 23 years trying to get published, but in the seven years that I've been in the industry, my personal experience has been nothing but positive. We all know there's lots of work still to be done to create a level playing field, not just for, for writers of color, but for, for any demographic. But I've spent the past six months working on a project tackling these issues. And I've spoken to people from around the industry. And I genuinely believe that the vast majority of people want to see change and are trying their best to make it happen. Unfortunately, it takes a lot to make an elephant turn around. But I honestly believe we're headed in the right direction. And I don't think we acknowledge those honest efforts enough. And I wanted to just, just touch on that and do that tonight. Anyway, enough with the grandstanding uh, and on to the thank yous. I want to thank the people who made this book and my career possible, my team at Hodder, Hachette, Ruth Tross and Kerry Hood, who were there at the beginning, uh, Stephen Cooper, my publicist, and my editor, Joe Dickinson, who cracked the whip and made this uh, a much better book than I could have done on my own. A special thank you to my agent, Ewan Thornycroft at AM Heath, who took pity on me and allowed that boy who'd waited so very, very long with his face pressed up against the glass to finally enter the sweet shop. I'd like to thank my great friends, the Red Hot Chili writers, Abir, who you've heard from so eloquently already, Imran, Aisha, Amit, and Alex. And if you haven't listened to our Red Hot Chili Writers podcast, you really should. Uh, if you don't leave it laughing, Abir will buy you each a goat in a color of your choosing. <laughs> I want to thank my family, my brothers and sisters, my wife, who I dragged from India to cold, wet England, and who for some strange reason has never thanked me for it. And my late parent, my dad, and my mother, who didn't live to see me published, but who's probably up there somewhere, nudging her arch rival, Mrs. Hussein, in the ribs and telling her, my son is better than your son. And lastly, I want to thank the crime fiction community, readers, reviewers, bloggers, fellow writers, the judges of this award for, for giving me this honor, my fellow nominees who've written equally wonderful books, and I know because I've read some of them. And last but not least, the CWA for championing crime writers everywhere of all feathers. Thank you all. Congratulations, Vas. So now we come to the John Creasy New Blood Dagger. John Creasy, who's sadly probably more remembered than read these days, founded the Crime Writers Association in 1953 
and he served as its first chair. He also created these very awards we are giving out tonight uh, in 1955. He was himself an enormously prolific writer, far more prolific than any of the people involved tonight. He wrote more than 600 novels under 28 different pseudonyms. Now, the chair of the genuine panel is, well, he's ostensibly retired. And if you believe that, you will believe anything. Publisher, music aficionado, Someday we're supposed to have a meal in which he'll tell me all about his orchestral duties and raconteur, the inimitable Edwin Buchalter. And the shortlisted books are The Creek on the Stairs by Ava Björg Ayastotia, translated by Victoria Cribb and published by Arenda Books. City of Ghosts by Ben Creed, published by Welbeck. The One That Got Away by Egan Hughes, published by Sphere. The Bone Jar by S.W. Kane, published by Thomas and Mercer. Fortune Favors the Dead by Stephen Spotswood, published by Wildfire. And Three Fifths by John Vercher, published by Pushkin Press. And he reaches for the envelope. The winner is The Creek on the Stairs by Eva Björk Egestatia, translated by Victoria Cribb, and published by Arenda. So I've just been told she is not present. The judges call this book subtle, complex, and reflexive, a tale of angst and guilt as the secrets of a small but seemingly respectable town are unearthed layer by layer, atmospheric and immensely satisfying with a heroine who has great serious potential. But she is here in the sense that we have a video. So let's see that now. Hi, I'm Eoburg Ayastater, the author of The Creek on the Stairs. Uh, I'm so honored to have won this prize as an Icelandic debut author in translation. This means the world to me and I cannot thank my translator, Victoria Kripp, enough. She has done a tremendous job in translating the book perfectly to English. Thank you so much, Vicky. Uh, I also want to thank my wonderful publisher, Karen Sullivan, Nat Orenta Books. She has been my greatest cheerleader uh, through this process and she has worked so hard on presenting the book for English read readers. Uh, I just couldn't be more happy that my books have found a home at Orenta. Also my agent, David Hadley, who was uh, so fantastic at his job. Thank you so much. And finally, thank you to the judges. I am so thrilled that you enjoyed The Creek on the Stairs. Thank you all so much. Congratulations, Ava, and see how the great and good get recognized here. David Hadley, Karen Sullivan, everybody gets a name check who should. Now, have you got a bottle of wine open? And if not, why not? Because get ready to charge your glasses, if they're not already charged, for the evening's three most coveted awards. And we begin with Ian Fleming Steel Dagger. When asked what are the ingredients of a thriller, Ian Fleming's answer was, anything that will thrill any of the human senses, absolutely anything. This award is for thrillers set in any period and includes, but isn't limited to, spy fiction, psychological thrillers, and action-adventure stories. The chair of the judging panel is Corinne Turner of Ian Fleming Publications, who sponsored this award. Corinne has assiduously managed and helped develop author estates for around 30 years. So let's hear from Corinne now. Good evening. I'm Corinne Turner, Managing Director of Ian Fleming Publications. We are delighted to have sponsored the Steel Dagger Award for another year, celebrating once again the best in contemporary thriller writing. We enjoy our involvement with the CWA and the Steel Dagger enormously. It keeps us in touch with long-standing masters of the genre and introduces us to the stars of the future. And here we are again, raising our glasses at home to toast a wonderful selection of authors on the shortlist. I would like to thank them for helping me escape a busy lockdown life. When not at my desk, I was on a quest for redemption in small town America, following a favourite investigative duo between Cornwall and London, asking will they, won't they? Experiencing the supernatural with a new crime-solving team on board a 17th century ship, trapped with an unknown killer in a snowbound luxury alpine chalet, exploring the shocking past and present of two quirky and complex young trauma survivors, 
intensely following an all-too-realistic serial killer and his sole surviving victim in Cork. I'm grateful to you all for such wonderful distractions and wish you luck this evening. Thank you, Corrine. So the shortlisted books are Troubled Blood by Robert Galbraith, published by Sphere. When She Was Good by Michael Robotham, published by Sphere. The Nothing Man by Catherine Ryan Howard, published by Atlantic Books. The Devil and the Dark Water by my fellow Merseysider, Stuart Turton, published by Raven Books. One by One by Ruth Ware, published by Vintage. And We Begin at the End by Chris Whitaker, published by Zaffer. And the winner is When She Was Good by Michael Robertham, published by Sphere. So I'm going to get my glass of wine. I hadn't realized I'd be drinking quite so much wine tonight. It's been like being at an author meal again. The judges call this book a dark and at times extremely poignant novel built on a foundation of finely observed and credible characterizations, notably that of Evie, the strong-willed teenage girl at the center of the story. It's engrossing, but also subtle, with gentle and unexpected moments of humor. So congratulations, Michael. Thank you very much, Barry. I mean, that's a, this is a huge thrill. I was sort of raising a coffee because it's 5.30 in the morning here. I've been up since um, 4.30, but, you know, things you do. I love this. I love the CWA. I love the daggers, and they've been very good to me. Um, um, I've been fascinated by your bookshelf. It's all in alphabetical order. Why, did, why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> yeah, neither am I. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I want to thank my um, my wonderful uh, shortlisted uh, authors, um, Joe, Catherine, Stuart, Ruth, and Chris. Um, uh, it's a <laughs> huge honor. It's funny. I think I've, I've been up against um, Robert Galbraith twice now and managed to. I mean, I mean, Joe will beat me on every other every other thing she she does. <laughs> I've managed to twice come in a pipper at the post for a for a dagger. Um, I want to thank the CWA and and the judges. Um, the Ian Fleming Publications and, and Family, my wonderful publishers, Little Brown UK, um, my agents, Mark Lucas, Richard Pine, uh, Nikki Kennedy and Sam Edinburgh. Uh, and um, uh, I want to thank the readers um, out there. I mean, there are so many wonderful books to choose from and we've seen so many showcased um, tonight. And um, I still am in awe of the fact that readers will go into a library or a bookshop and and choose one of my books, um, which is a privilege and an honour, um, and I'm humbled always by it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, and congratulations. I can remember when Michael was writing another kind of book altogether, but we're all very glad he turned to crime. So we're almost at the climax of the evening. So thank you for staying with us. But before we get to the gold dagger for the best crime novel of the year, we're going to present a keenly desired award, the 2021 Diamond Dagger. Now, the Diamond Dagger is the Crime Writers Association's highest honor, an award that recognizes authors whose crime writing careers have been marked by sustained excellence and who have made a significant contribution to the genre. The recipient is selected from nominations by CWA members. Now, as always, this year's recipient was announced earlier in the year so many of you will already know that the winner is a woman who routinely storms the bestseller lists and has done so with remarkable consistency for many years, the one and only Martina Cole. CWA Chair Maxim Jakubowski, whom we heard from earlier, spoke to Martina about this year's award and her work, and we have a video of that conversation to show you now. Martina Cole, uh, as chair of the Crime Writers Association, I'm both happy and proud to greet you as uh, this year's recipient of the Diamond Dagger, well, which uh, is something that obviously many of your peers have received in the past and that in my own personal view uh, was long overdue. So congratulations. It's been, it was such a fantastic um, lift when I found out about it, earlier, you know, earlier in the year, it was such a great lift. Um, and it's such a great honour. It's something that I always dreamed of, you know. So it's wonderful 
Thank you. Thank you very much. It's given by all your friends in the crime community and the CWA. Uh, because, in fact, I mean, one of the interesting things about your career, obviously, I don't want to go over all the stories which have mm. gone in so many interviews. Obviously, you started writing late. Mm. You were a single mother. And you never moved in literary circles before. And yeah. you had a story in you that you wanted to write. Someone said something to me recently, um, Kimberly Chambers, and she said to me, if I hadn't read your books, Tina, I never would have tried to write. And I'll take that as a big compliment. Mm -hmm. I remember years and years ago, Dali rang me up one, my agent, one Sunday morning, and he said to me, have you seen the Sunday Times, Martina? And I said, not yet, no, you know, just got up. He said, well, they've just described a book as in the genre of Martina Cole. He said, so, I think we can safely say that you've discovered a whole new genre. And oh, absolutely. Was, I was very proud of that. I'm proud, you know, that, you know, I opened up sort of other worlds for people, and especially for other authors. As I said, you have created almost your own genre within the crime uh category uh, and uh, now lots of other people write in your footsteps uh, but also I think what is what is important I think for us at the CWA is that you've opened up the crime genre to a whole category of readers who maybe before weren't actually that interested in reading books. When I do the prison workshops as well I talk to men and women there who say I've never picked up a book in my life but I read you and um, I used to get that a lot on book signings as well and book signings was still the thing. Um, you know, people say to me, I never read a book in my life, but, you know, someone gave this to me and, you know, one of your books or I picked it up on holiday or someone, you know, brought it around when I was in the hospital. Um, and, you know, because they read me, they now, they now went on to read other people. And that's why I think I love being such a big part of the reading agency and, this, you know, the six book challenge and things like that. Reading's always been such a big part of my life. I wanted to write a book because I wanted to see my name on a book. Um, and funnily enough, I was chatting with my friend earlier this week. And when I was a kid, I think Magwitch, I think Magwitch gave me my, my love of criminals with a heart. <laughs> well, and then obviously I went on from there to sort of Graham Greene and things. So, um, you know, I, I've always liked the fact that, that people can although perceived by everybody as bad, they can actually be quite good people and vice versa. There's some very good people who have not been very good. So, Well, yeah. actually, there is very much a Dickensian atmosphere in all your East London books. I mean, the way you've managed, obviously, because of first-hand knowledge, of bringing basically the right. modern East London to life. Well, Dickens meets Catherine Cookson for one of my books. I think that was my third book, which started in, in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you remember... What the first major crime book you read? Uh... When I was a child, my mum was a nurse. She was a psychiatric nurse and she used to read all the true confessions and true crime magazines. And my sister Loretta, my middle sister Loretta, was six years old than me and we used to devour them, you know, because she worked nights. So as soon as my mum went to work, we used to track them all out. And they used to have all these lurid pictures of women with ties around their necks and things, you know. And we were absolutely fascinated with them. And to be honest with you, I, th I think that gave me my interest in crime. And the estate that I grew up on, the cancer estate that I grew up on, was full of people who were in and out of prison. To, you know, some were quite frightening people. Others were your friends your school friends' dads or brothers or whatever. So so I think I grew up with with quite an understanding of, of the different levels of crime, you know, and mm -hmm. and what's acceptable and what's not, really. Um, and I, I've always been quite fascinated with true crime. And I, I, when I'm in the prisons and people say to me, you know, oh, Martina, um, that could be my life, I take that as a compliment. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book called Two Women about two women in prison for murdering their husbands. And I was in Belmarsh doing a, doing a class and this young guy said to me, that could have been my life. It was like you were looking in the window and, uh, you know, Susan Dawson's house, the birthday party where he, you know, beat her up before the birthday party and the, the aggression towards her. He said that could have been my mum's life. Um, and I, I was glad to see that he went on to do education after that. He stopped, you know, he still used to come in when I, I went to the, the writing lessons, um, the writing classes, but he then went on to do a degree, which I thought was amazing.
A final question, uh, which I think uh, many other people in our virtual audience are probably uh, eagerly waiting uh, for an answer to. Obviously, we know you. it's been a tough couple of years for us all, for you on the health uh, side, uh, for everybody else, and you, of course, with the pandemic. And um, you had to skip a year because you've been there year after year with your number one hits. Can you tell us a bit about your next book, Loyalty? Loyalty is out next year, I think now. Um, it's out next year and it basically deals with, with two women who who very, very, very close from young. They were in care together and they're more like sisters and they married two completely different kinds of men and they're two, two completely polar opposites, the women, but very, very, very close for something that happened to them when they were very young. And the book follows both their lives and something happens and unfolds at the end, which sort of impacts on everybody in the end. And that's why I called it loyalty. Well, I think that's something that uh, everybody in our virtual room at the award <laughs> is looking forward to. And Martin Cole. CWA 2021 Diamond Dagger. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you too. Congratulations, Martina. So now without further ado, the final award of the evening. It is time for the coveted CWA Gold Dagger, which is awarded to the best crime or thriller novel originally written in English and first published in the UK during the awards period. I uh, sometimes have a problem when talking about CWA judges. Here's a good example. There are currently two judges who I have on separate occasions called Britain's Best Crime Fiction Bookseller. One of them is David Headley, who's been mentioned several times tonight. But the chair of the CWA Gold Dagger judging panel is undoubtedly Britain's best crime fiction bookseller working in Cambridge, and he is the companionable Richard Reynolds. And the shortlisted books for this award are Blacktop Wasteland by S.A. Cosby, published by Headline. City of Ghosts by Ben Creed, published by Welbeck. House of Correction by Nicky French, published by Simon & Schuster. Troubled Blood by Robert Galbraith, published by Sphere. The Postscript Murders by Ellie Griffiths, published by Quercus. Midlight Atlanta by Thomas Mullen, published by Little Brown. And We Begin at the End by Chris Whitaker, published by Zaffa. Now, before we get to the winner, the judges highly commended two books for this award, and they are Blacktop Wasteland by S.A. Cosby, published by Headline. The judges called it a no-holds-barred noir novel of despair, redemption, and inner turmoil. And House of Correction by Nikki French, published by Simon Schuster. The judges said, the jeopardy is real and the mystery compelling, an edgy, thoughtful, and clever standalone mystery. Our congratulations go to them for being recognized, which is no mean achievement. But the winner of the CWA Gold Dagger 2021 is We Begin at the End by Chris Whitaker, published by Zaffa. The judges said, This sublime emotional roller coaster sweeps you into and beyond the crime genre with its intense portrayal of love, loss, despair, and redemption. And in fact, I seem to remember, Chris, I picked your book as a book of the year for. Of the eye, I think. So congratulations, Chris. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can. Um, I'm, I don't know what to say. I'm genuinely shocked. I, um, I was lucky enough to win a dagger um, quite a few years ago and didn't prepare a speech. So, you know, <laughs> I've carried on that tradition tonight. Um, <laughs> thank you to the judges, obviously. Thank you to you, Barry, and to Abir for the brilliant speech. Um, thank you to my amazing publisher, Bonnier, and to my amazing editor, Catherine. Um, we worked for so long, for so many years on this book. Um, and to Amy Einhorn in the US and the team at Henry Holt. Um, I just can't believe it. I'm completely shocked. Um, my dad is watching this. Um, he's my first reader. So I'm going to say thank you to him. And um, my daughter has been keeping me company. <laughs> down here throughout this um 
I really can't believe it. I'm over the moon. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone that voted. Um, thank you to everyone that's gone out and bought the book um, and championed me as a writer. And, um, and I work at my local library and some of them are watching as well. So hello to everyone there. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Congratulations, Chris. I see your daughter's already a critic. <laughs> <laughs> so we bring the evening to a close. Ladies and gentlemen, those were the CWA daggers for 2021. I'm going to take my last sip of wine. The winners have all been posted to the CWA's Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash the underscore CWA. And a full list will soon be available on our website at www.thecwa.co.uk. Now, it just remains for me once again, and this is important, to thank all the judges and the panel chairs, Abby and Mukherjee for his speech, and the people working behind the scenes for the CWA to make the daggers happen. We didn't do too badly tonight, did we? We may have had a rocky start, but everything seemed to go reasonably okay. Those people I'm going to thank by name are Dagger Liaison Officer Mike Stotter, Chair Maxim Jakubowski, Secretary D. Parkin, Assistant Secretary Fiona Veach Smith, and the man who has held my hand electronically throughout this, the Joint Vice Chair Anthony Johnston, who produced tonight's event. Our congratulations to all the winners, and our thanks to you for once again tuning in to watch this unusual and hopefully not too shambolic version of the daggers. As there finally seems to be light at the end of the tunnel, dare we hope. We hope that for 2022, we once again be able to get dressed up. I'll have my tux on again and return to an in-person Daggers evening. We hope to see you there. Finally, thanks to our sponsors, ALCS, Ian Fleming Publications, Pro Writing Aid and Superior Books. Thank you for watching and good night. <laughs>